Hey, welcome back everyone. First off, some breaking news. As massive floods continue in 27 provinces in southern and central China, the whereabouts of top CCP officials are still unknown. And this is continuing a trend that started just ahead of news about the new virus outbreaks in Beijing and new lockdown measures that have taken place there. First off, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang went to Guizhou on July 6 and 7, allegedly to investigate poverty alleviation and flood prevention and resettlement, as the CCP is saying it. Yet the move is questionable, as Guizhou is not one of the main disaster zones. Chinese netizens also pointed out that Li's inspections were mostly posted on social media and had few official reports on them. And given that a top CCP official responding to a major disaster in China in any normal case would be used in state propaganda, the relative silence among the CCP's news agencies suggests they are trying to downplay the reporting on Li. And similar questions are being asked about the whereabouts of CCP leader Xi Jinping. He did not show up at any of the disaster areas and has not been seen in Beijing either. Now, according to reporting from state-run CCTV, Xi's last public appearance was on June 30 at the Central Political Bureau. Now, analysts have taken Xi's unknown whereabouts, particularly when China is facing disasters and crisis pretty much across the board, to suggest that he is trying to avoid Beijing and also the new virus outbreaks there. And this is again in context of his recent moves for, quote, political security. And while Xi hasn't made any public appearances, he has been taking some major steps to strengthen his control over the CCP's military, the People's Liberation Army. And he has also taken steps to purge officials from the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission. Now taken together, this suggests that the internal fighting between factions within the CCP has reached new levels of intensity. This is raising additional speculation that she may also be trying to conceal his whereabouts because of this party infighting. And as this is taking place, a large number of Chinese military vehicles were shown in videos on July 14, parked along the roadsides in Wuhan, the epicenter of this new coronavirus, the CCP virus, which has also now been hit by severe floods. Now, details on why this is happening are slim, but netizens believe there were at least a few hundred military vehicles seen in Wuhan, and that they were also moved to protect Wuhan for some reason. It also signals the CCP may have abandoned Poyang, which has been one of the hardest hit areas by the floods. Now in Poyang, for example, videos have shown scenes of the Zhuijiang Dike collapsing in Jiangxi and of massive floodwaters pouring out while people run for their lives. And on the note of these floods in China, they are continuing and the situation for the Chinese people is growing even worse. In the capital city of Jiangxi province, Nanchang City, it was hit hard by massive floods. And in the surrounding counties, residents in towns and villages have been trapped by the floodwaters for close to 72 hours. Traffic and communications to these areas has been cut off. Meanwhile, in Jinxiang County, many villages around Qinlan Lake have been severely flooded. Now, one of the locals in one of these villages, a Mr. Zhao, said in an interview that when the village flooded on July 9th, his wife left with his children and his family now worries about his safety. He stayed behind to care for the family's chickens. And this is other significance. Now, for Chinese farmers in many areas, these floods have destroyed their farmlands. For some of these families, all they have left are a small portion of their livestock and chickens. And these have become essential for their survival. Mr. Zhao said he's concerned about the future based on this, and he's hoping the Chinese regime will offer relief. However, there has not yet been any aid from the Chinese government. And the CCP's plans for relief would grant only around 10 renminbi, which is about $1.50 per family, that has been affected by these floods, and that won't even go directly to them. That'll go towards rebuilding infrastructure. Now, in other news related to Hong Kong, Chinese officials, entities, and even banks that were involved in the new national security laws in Hong Kong, which have effectively ended Hong Kong's autonomy, will now be hit with sanctions. Now, President Donald Trump signed a bill into law on July 14th that will now roll out these sanctions. Now, at a press conference, Trump said this, quote, Their freedom has been taken away, their rights have been taken away, and with it goes Hong Kong, in my opinion, because it will no longer be able to compete with free markets. A lot of people will be leaving Hong Kong, I suspect. Today, I also signed an executive order ending U.S. preferential treatment for Hong Kong. Hong Kong will now be treated the same as mainland China.
And adding to this, Trump also signed an executive order that will be ending U.S. preferential treatment of Hong Kong. Trump said this would, quote, hold China accountable for its oppressive actions against the people of Hong Kong. Now, in addition to this, there are also reports of a third wave of outbreaks in the new coronavirus, the CCP virus in Hong Kong, where 42 cases have now been confirmed. Yet locals there are questioning the validity of these reports, given that these coincide with the CCP's establishment of the new national security office in the city. This is raising concerns that the CCP, the Chinese regime, is using the virus as an additional tool in order to forbid protests. Now for the broader stories for today, first off, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to silence a dissident in Australia. Now a Chinese woman living in Australia on a working holiday visa says Chinese authorities have been tracking and harassing her parents since April because of her criticisms against the CCP. Now she published tweets critical of Communist Party leader Xi Jinping, organized rallies in Melbourne to support Hong Kong protesters and stated her support for the Chinese doctor who first warned about the new coronavirus and later died. Now the woman, whose name is Dong Wu Yuan and is nicknamed Zhu, spoke with SBS News in Australia. She gave them a video of one of the Chinese police officers speaking to her and in the video her father is also present, again suggesting her family is being pressured. The police officer saying in the video, quote, Let me tell you, you need to remember you are a citizen of the People's Republic of China. You are not in the country, but remember, if China wasn't great and strong, you would have no status. Do you understand? It states that Zhu is warned to not insult Xi and is asked to hand over her Twitter password. And so what are we seeing here? Now, this is actually not uncommon for the Chinese Communist Party to do. You might remember, for example, Anastasia Lin, who is this beauty queen in Canada, whose father was threatened because she started criticizing the Chinese regime's abuses of human rights. Now, under Operation Fox, the Chinese Communist Party's Ministry of State Security was carrying out arrests on U.S. soil of these different Chinese officials who were fleeing from the CCP. And if it could not arrest them themselves, it was going after their family members and pressuring their family members to encourage them to either turn themselves in or commit suicide. The Chinese Communist Party does many things like this, and it's not uncommon at all for them to threaten Chinese when they're abroad. It's not uncommon at all for them to go after overseas Chinese, even U.S. citizens, even Australian citizens. And it's also not uncommon for them to go after their family members who are still living in China to put pressure on them. Now also, the Chinese Communist Party has issued new travel warnings in Australia and claims Australian police are arbitrarily searching Chinese citizens and stealing their property. Now, the claims were denied by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which told the Sydney Morning Herald, quote, These assertions are factually incorrect and disinformation. There is no basis for the suggestion Australian law enforcement authorities conduct arbitrary searches or property seizures. Now, the travel warnings and accusations from the CCP appear to be a tit-for-tat move by the regime, since the language used by the CCP is almost identical to travel warnings issued by Australia to people traveling to China. And what's the context of this? Now, the Chinese Communist Party again recently passed its national security laws over Hong Kong. Part of that are laws saying it can go after people who are not Chinese citizens. And so it's extending these laws to even go after, say, U.S. businessmen, foreign businessmen, or people critical of the Chinese Communist Party's abuses of human rights. And the Chinese Communist Party isn't just doing this to Australia. Now, the United States also issued travel warnings for people going to China based on the same grounds that Americans traveling to China risk arrest, and the CCP also pushed back on the U.S. for doing so. Now, a main concern for countries around the world in the national security law, again, this is what they just passed over Hong Kong, is Article 38, which is being interpreted as a threat from the CCP to potentially issue arrest warrants for people in any part of the world who criticize the Chinese Communist Party, or who violate its laws on free speech or belief. Now, the CCP law states this, at least translated to English, quote, This law shall apply to offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region. Now, what does that mean? Donald Clark, a professor at the George University Law School, wrote this in an analysis, quote, I know of no reason not to think it means what it appears to say. It is asserting extraterritorial jurisdiction over every person on the planet, end quote. And he adds this, quote, 
Remarkably, this provision gives the law an even broader reach than mainland criminal law. And so again, what are we seeing here? The United States, again, came out and issued travel warnings on China. Other countries are following suit, and the CCP is fighting back against them. Across the board, the CCP is using very similar tactics, which is it takes whatever is being accused of doing and accuses the other countries of doing the same thing. Not just the CCP, but communist movements overall. They say, accuse the others of what you yourself are accused of. That is their strategy. And on the note of the Chinese Communist Party's tit-for-tat moves, it's now saying it will sanction Lockheed Martin for its arms sales to Taiwan, claiming the United States is planning to contain the Chinese mainland. And so again, this is the same pattern we're seeing, right? In the context of the CCP's sanctions on U.S. lawmakers, for example, where it sanctioned three U.S. lawmakers and one ambassador, that was in response to those same individuals calling for sanctions on Chinese Communist Party officials for their human rights abuses in Xinjiang and other regions targeting Chinese Muslims. And so again, tit for tat move. The CCP is using the same tactics people are using against it, against them, using the same narratives to attack them, but on uneven ground. Why, for example, did it go after those lawmakers? It went after them for placing sanctions on the CCP. And this again takes place right after the Chinese Communist Party broke its agreement on Hong Kong with its national security laws, which effectively ended its agreement with Hong Kong and autonomy. This is raising concern in Taiwan, which is the significance of this Lockheed Martin arms deal with Taiwan, that they could be next. And so in other words, the people in Taiwan, they're looking across the sea right now, and they're seeing that Hong Kong just got taken over by the CCP. They're seeing the CCP did not uphold its side of the bargain when it came to this one country, two systems policy, that Hong Kong lost its autonomy, and the CCP does not care about violating international law when doing so. And so Taiwan now, many people are there, are concerned that the CCP may make them next, and the CCP has stated it would do so. We mentioned previously, the Chinese military has replicas of the Taiwanese presidential palace on at least one of their training facilities. The CCP trains for raids on Taiwan. And now this is also in context, playing a bit deeper into this, on the United States issuing an official rejection of most of the Chinese regime's claims over the South China Sea. And it is important note on this, the Chinese Communist Party's nine-dash line, which it uses to outline its claims to that area, includes Taiwan. And so in other words, under the Chinese Communist Party's claims over the South China Sea, it claims that it owns Taiwan. Now, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said this in a July 13th statement, quote, we are making clear Beijing's claims to offshore resources across most of the South China Sea are completely unlawful, as it is a campaign of bullying to control them. Now, this comes on the heels of a June 27 joint statement from 10 member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, that criticized the CCP for violating the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. You might remember the CCP is claiming it has historical ownership over the region. That battle went to the courts. The CCP lost that court battle. And despite losing that international criminal case, the CCP still claims it has, say, historical ownership over that whole region. And basically told that country, as well, you say that we're wrong. If you want to come challenge it, come to mainland China's courts and challenge us there, which are kangaroo courts. They run them. Now, in addition, there is increasing pushback against the CCP from countries around the world. The United Kingdom just announced at Huawei, this Chinese telecom company, that its 5G equipment must be removed from the country within seven years. And UK mobile providers will be banned from buying new Huawei 5G equipment after December 31st. Now, the Times also revealed that UK military leaders have established plans to move one of Britain's aircraft carriers to base in the, quote, Far East, and will conduct military exercises with the United States and Japan. And this is being taken as a sign that the UK may move to challenge the CCP's ownership of the South China Sea alongside the United States and Japan. This is being taken in context of recent U.S. military maneuvers to show freedom of navigation through the South China Sea, showing defiance of the CCP's claims over that region. Now, for some additional news on Huawei, the U.S. State Department announced it will impose visa restrictions on employees of Huawei and other Chinese tech companies that have aided human rights violations around the world. And this is a move that could bar these individuals from entering the United States. 
This is also the latest action by the Trump administration targeting human rights abuses by the CCP. And U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said at a press briefing, The State Department will impose visa restrictions on certain employees of, the Chinese, of Chinese technology companies like Huawei that provide material support to regimes engaging in human rights violations and abuses globally. Now, the department singled out Huawei in these statements, saying it was, quote, an arm of the CCP's surveillance state that censors political dissidents and enables mass internment camps in Xinjiang. And now, what we've been seeing recently is that when the United States is calling out the Chinese Communist Party for its human rights abuses, it's not just going after the CCP itself. It's not just going after companies themselves. It's going after CCP officials, holding them individually accountable. And with this now, we're seeing they're going after the employees of these companies as well. And the European Union, meanwhile, is considering measures against the CCP for its national security laws in Hong Kong. Swedish Foreign Minister Anne Lin said this, according to Reuters, quote, There is a proposal of measures especially proposed by Germany and France that I will support because we need to react to what is happening in Hong Kong. Now, these officials did not detail what measures they're considering. But this could lead to a larger response from the European Union against the CCP. And in some deeper context to this, this also takes place as Sweden is calling for the release of Swedish citizen Gui Min Huai, who was sentenced to 10 years in prison by the CCP in February for running a bookstore in Hong Kong that was selling books critical of the Chinese leadership. Now Sweden is again calling for Gui's release. And also some broader context on this. The Chinese Communist Party was lashing out against many of these same leaders. It has, again, this wolf-warrior diplomacy. Its policy of, say, very harsh criticism against any, say, criticism of the CCP. It's meeting force with force. And so you may remember when this virus was at its height in many parts of the world, countries were asking, where did it come from? And all sides turned to the Chinese Communist Party, and it's a lack of transparency on where the virus actually came from, what an intermediary species was, how it spread, and so on. Many of the narratives the CCP was releasing to the world, including through the WHO, were debunked. And so this, the world, right now as we speak, still does not know exactly where that virus came from. And the world was calling for investigations into the origin of it. As that was happening, as these different leaders in Germany and Australia and other countries started asking about what the origin was, the CCP began attacking them. CCP began lashing out against them, threatening, for example, trade sanctions against many of these countries. And what was the result of that? The result was the opposite effect. Many different leaders talked about how the Chinese Communist Party's mask, this, say, friendly facade it had put on previously for the world, had fallen off. And its true face was now showing to them. And now you see what's happening to it. The CCP's actions have had the opposite effect. These countries are now coming together to criticize the CCP. And also the criticism against the CCP from the European Union is now expanding to measures against its actions in Hong Kong and its human rights abuses more broadly. In other words, they're, now lo they're no longer just talking about this virus. They're now criticizing the CCP for abusing its own people. They're criticizing the CCP for what it's doing in Hong Kong. And they're criticizing the CCP for other authoritarian measures that it has been taking. And now with that said, let's jump into some updates on the United States. First off, New York City is now requiring people from 19 states to self-quarantine if they travel to the city, including from California, Florida, and Texas. And to enforce this, Governor Andrew Cuomo will require out-of-state travelers from the 19 states to submit their contact details when they arrive. And Cuomo wrote this on Twitter, quote, If you fail to provide it, you will receive a summons and a $2,000 fine. Now, a State Department of Health traveler form will be given to people on their flights to New York State, and Cuomo will have enforcement teams at all state airports to collect them from travelers. Meanwhile, there's some new pushback against the mail-in ballot policies, which mainly Democrats have been pushing for amid the pandemic. California election officials have rejected 100,000 mail-in ballots for alleged mistakes, according to data obtained by Associated Press. And it claims that more than 70,000 were rejected because they were mailed after deadline, and more than 27,000 were either missing signatures or had signatures that did not match records. This is again tying into the concerns over the integrity of mail-in ballots, whether they can lead to a fair election. 
And also in some non-virus news, a new bill would allow victims of the Seattle Chaz site to sue state and local officials for failing to protect their rights and their property. And if this bill passes, it could result in additional lawsuits against local officials themselves in cities and states where they're being accused of allowing violent protests and damage to local businesses to take place. And also on the note of Seattle, a petition to recall Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin has been approved by a King County Superior Court judge. Again, and this is also something happening in many areas where you had these violent protests. And meanwhile, Trump has denounced what he's referring to as the, quote, anti-cop crusade being pushed by some mayors, lawmakers, and political organizations. Far-left mayors are escalating the anti-cop crusade and violent crime is spiraling in their cities. And he's now hearing from families who were helped by law enforcement. And around the same time as this, tying this all together, the George Soros-backed Open Society Foundation issued a press release stating it would give $220 million to initiatives that would advance causes on racial justice and inequality. The money will allegedly go to emerging organizations and leaders for, quote, building power in black communities in the United States and help their efforts to, quote, sustain the momentum towards racial equality. And so what's the broader context of this? Well, the United States just saw many different forms of protest sweep across the entire country. Actually, not just the United States, but many other countries as well, including in many parts of Europe. What happened? Now, reports are mixed, and you're gonna have different views depending on which side of the political aisle you're on. But what we can say is that even organizers of these protests were claiming the protests were hijacked by people with very extreme motives. Again, there were claims of Antifa, there were claims, some, some saying far-right organizations. Evidence on that has been very slim. But what we do know is that Attorney General William Barr has said that they're going to be going after these extremist organizations that were behind these violent protests and riots. We have evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political uh, persuasions, have been involved in instigating and participating in the violent activity. We have some uh, investigations underway and very uh, focused investigations on certain individuals that relate to Antifa. And again, I'll state my analysis on this. We really saw three to four different types of protests take place. Now, for example, there were the organized protests, many of which were planned by these different socialist organizations, such as Freedom Road Socialists. Many of these were openly planned by them or their affiliated groups. There were the grassroots protests, people legitimately going out and say expressing their grievances for things they believe in. There were opportunists, criminal organizations many times using this as an opportunity to go loot. And then there were different extremist organizations allegedly such as Antifa and others who were using this as an opportunity to push for their own agendas. Now when it comes to this, investigations in the United States are being done right now to look into who these organizations are. And again, Barr has stated the U.S. government is now investigating these different organizations, and this is why we're not seeing mass arrests on these individuals. Very likely they're going to be hit all at once, and that has not yet happened. It will not happen until they've completed these investigations. And now what's the deeper context of this? In addition to Barr saying that the U.S. government is now investigating these extremist organizations that were behind the riots, different officials who, for example, may have enabled some of the violence to take place, such as in Seattle where the, say, Chad site was allowed to stay there and many people were shot and killed because of it. The people who were responsible for that, these different government officials who allowed this through their own policies, they may be sued by different people who were affected by the violence, by the crime, by the looting. And that happened in many parts of the United States. We'll have to see if this bill is passed. Again, one big difference would be whether the officials themselves can be sued or whether a lawsuit would harm taxpayers and the city, which is very likely how it would normally go if you were to file a lawsuit. We'll again have to see how this plays out. Now again, folks, are broadcasting this show Monday through Friday, five days a week, so be sure to tune in. And also, if you want to show your support for this channel, we do have a Patreon. You can find the link to it in the description below. And for our Patreon supporters, we'll be doing a live Q&A every Sunday. And also, folks, if you want to show your support in other ways, please like and subscribe on this channel. It really helps us. And also, if you can, please tell a friend or family member about this channel. Of course, folks, with that said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.